notice Sunday morning is the time that you get the most bent with your family? My wife has a rule about church. This is her rule. Once you sit down, you don't move. She's here tonight. If one of you stood up to leave for a moment, she'd turn to the friend sitting next to her and go, look at that. She doesn't like it when you move. So she gathered us all together and she said, new rule. We get to church, you don't move. Anything you have to do, you do before church. Because once you sit, you do not move. We all said, okay, good rule. It is a good rule. But there's got to be exceptions. We stood up to sing a hymn one day. I turned to her and I said, I need to leave. I'll be right back. She turned to me and said, you know the rule. You will not move. I said, but, but I need to move. I will come right back. She said, if you move, you'll set a bad example. I said, if I stay, I'm going to set a bad example. <laughs> Against her will, I left. I had to. I went to the bathroom real quick, came back. In fact, I got back before the song was done. Slid into the row, sat down, and put my arm around her. I could feel hostility just radiating from her body. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Why should she be so angry? So I put my hand on her shoulder, and I gently just hugged her. Beneath the pew, where no one could see, she took her elbow and she began to grind her elbow into my ribs. This is a woman I love, grinding <laughs> her elbow into my ribs. I turned to her to tell her, this is stupid. It wasn't my wife. I'd moved into the wrong row. My wife was sitting right behind me. And the rest of the church is rolling on the floor. Now, do you suppose that God looked down on that scene and went, Look, my people are having fun. No. I don't think so. I think God looked down and he went, Angels, come here. Look at this idiot. I know this is a dumb question, but have you ever done something like so stupid and embarrassing that you wish nobody had ever seen it? Right? Like, like let alone God, but, but you wish nobody ever, ever seen it. And I was thinking in my mind, what could I say? And there were so many options to choose from, but... But the one that came to my mind was last fall, I was going to a home football game over here at the stadium, and, and it was kind of, it wasn't fully dark, but it was pretty dark outside, and I'd park my car down by the ball field, and I'm walking there uh, behind, the, behind the fence where the, on the other side of the student section, and I'm walking along on the fence, all of a sudden, like, I just, I just fell down. I mean, I just like, boom, fell down. And um, I, I was so embarrassed, and I kind of like looked around a little bit, and I didn't think anybody saw me. Got up, started walking, took three steps, fell again. I kid you not. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's the matter with me? And so I, I got up, and I turned around. <laughs> There's a whole group of students watching me, seriously. And they were like, sir, sir, are you, are you okay? Like, can, you know, there's a handicap section right over there, sir. And, and one, of, one of the, I swear, no joke, one of the kids was looking up on his phone the, the website for Lifeline, right? Like, I've fallen and I can't get up. Sir, maybe, maybe, you, should, maybe you should get one of these things. And I'm like, that, like I, that was embarrassing. And, and I'm sure that you have been in the same situation where you've got some, like, negative attention. But we also like positive attention. We love it when somebody catches us doing something right. We love positive attention. And it doesn't matter how old you get, how accomplished you get in your field. It, it doesn't matter anything. We always kind of perk up and we love when somebody says to us something good. When, when they notice something, whether it's a spouse or a parent or a mentor or, or whoever it is, we just love when somebody notices us and says, hey, hey, great job on that presentation or, or you did that really well or congratulations on walking three feet without falling down. I mean, we love it. We love it when people catch us doing something good. And so I got to thinking, are there times that we, that we can get heaven's attention by things that we do? Are there times and things that we can do that God, God might look down upon us and, and, and not say, hey, look at this idiot, but say, hey, look, look at what Look at what my child, my son, my daughter is going to do. Are there times and possibly times and ways that we can, that we can have God notice us and, and positively? 
Well, I think there are. I, I want to look at just a few verses, a few examples from Scripture. When we, when we get heaven's attention by demonstrating faith in the things that we do. Um, we are saved by faith. We are saved by grace. But it's so important that, that good actions and good works accompany the, this, this grace. And, and uh, James talks about this in his book all the time. And in James 2.22, he's talking about how Abraham was, was willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And then he said, you see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. We can get heaven's attention by demonstrating faith in things that we do. I'm going to look at a couple of these. And, and the first thing is that we can get heaven's attention when we demonstrate faith by being obedient. Parents, don't you love when your kids are obedient? Like just think, get, just get an example in your mind. Like some of you might take a while, but just think, you know, like, and we just love it when, when our kids are obedient. And it's kind of like when we're with people, we want to sort of show them off, right? Like they're, like they're kind of show dogs and we say, honey, now what do you say or what do you do? And then we're so proud when they, you know, make a mistake and do the right thing. But, but we love when our kids do that and we love, we love when they're obedient to us. And, and you know, God is our heavenly father and he is no different. God loves it when we demonstrate our faith simply by doing what he tells us to do. And we know this because we see this, first of all, in Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, God's son, Jesus Christ, is beginning his ministry. And so he sets the precedent and goes to John the Baptist and is baptized. And it says, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love and with you I am well pleased. Now let's understand that Jesus did not need to be baptized for forgiveness like you and I do. That's why John argued with him. John the Baptist said, Jesus, I should be baptizing you. But evidently, this is something that Jesus felt that his father wanted him to do, to take this simple step of obedience. And so God the Father was watching this whole thing unfold. And I can imagine that maybe he gathered some angels around him. And he said, come over here and look at this. He's my son. He's being baptized. I am so proud of him. And scripture tells us that all who call upon Jesus to be saved, all who want to be his sons and his daughters, who want to be Christ followers, that, that they ought to be baptized. This is the, one of the first steps of obedience we take. And heaven took notice of this radical obedience of Jesus. And God said to Jesus those words that we long to hear from, from our parents, from our spouses, from anybody whom we love and is dear to us. I am so proud of you. I am so pleased with what you did. Now, we don't understand everything about why God's word tells us to be baptized, but it's clear that it does, and, and that it's God's will for every one of us to be baptized, to be a Christ follower, to be immersed, to have our sins forgiven. It's a personal decision to align ourselves with God's will for us and to be obedient to our Father, Creator, Maker, Sustainer, and Redeemer. And I know that most of the time when a person is baptized, it's a, it's a, it's a day of celebration. It's a time of rejoicing. I've shared with you some stories of baptisms of here. Some are funny, some are touching, um, but, but, and God loved them all. But I understand that there are times when a person's baptism is, for whatever reason, not a cause for celebration. Uh, at a church we served at a different place, uh, we had a 16-year-old girl. She had been coming to our church, she, and she wanted so badly to, to be baptized. She was so convicted that she needed to be baptized, and, and we talked with her, and several of us talked with her, problem was her mom was not down with it. And her mom just did not want that to happen. She thought we were some kind of cult or something like that. And so we talked with the mom, several of us, you know, this is, this is an okay thing. Nicole needs to be baptized, but she would not budge. And so finally, in the end, we had no choice. We, we had to baptize the girl. We didn't want to do it without the parents' permission, but, but we had to do that. And so we baptized her. And, um, and, and even though her earthly parent may not have been pleased, you can bet, that especially because of the circumstances, her heavenly father looked down upon her and took notice of her and was well pleased. God was proud of her. We get heaven's attention when we just simply are obedient to what he tells us to do. We also get heaven's attention when we demonstrate faith by, by sacrificial giving. 
And so I, I love this. This is one of my favorite stories. One day Jesus, he's hanging out with his disciples. And he's just sitting there. He's people watching. You guys ever people watch? Go to the mall, go wherever. We were on the beach and when we were on vacation, we did a lot of people watching. And Jesus is just kind of there hanging out, watching people. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he sees something that he considers extraordinary. And it gets his attention. Well, what was he looking at? Well, he was, he was watching the people putting their offerings in the temple treasury. And so in that place, there would have been several big uh, brazen trumpets lining the walls. And, and people would have, would have come and thrown their, they'd throw their coins in there. And when they would throw their money in there, it would make this, this horrendous racket and, and noise. And, and people would look. And, and the more you put in, the more attention that you would draw to yourself. And so some people kind of made, kind of made a show of this to get the attention of people and to impress them. Well, Mark 12, 41 says, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put in. And he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and she put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. So these coins that she put in there were something called leptons or leptas. And understand this, that, that a denarius would be sort of the equivalent of the day's wage for an average working person, a denarius, all right? Uh, a day's wage for an average working person. To make a denarius, you would have to have 128 of these little coins that she put into the, into the offering. A, a minuscule amount of money, a very, very tiny coin. They, she probably threw them in there and probably nobody, nobody even heard them going in. But that's what she did. And I can see Jesus watching this thing unfold and he's thinking to himself, I, there's no way she's going to do that. Like, she is, not go, she is not going to do what I think she's, oh my gosh, she's going to do that. She's going to do it. And so he calls his disciples around in verse 43 and Jesus said, look, look at this. I tell you the truth that this poor widow has put in more in the treasury than all others. They gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. And so we can get heaven's attention when we, like that widow, give back to God sacrificially. And so at our church, we, we teach unapologetically that sacrificial giving and understanding that nothing we have belongs to us is so important to our growth, to our maturity as Christians. And we believe so strongly in this, that God's people are blessed when we give and when we show that faith in him and we, and we teach this because this is what the Bible says over and over and over. And one of the things we try to do is to make it as easy as possible to, to get in the habit of, of giving. This is, this is what it's all about. It's the habit of giving. For example, in your bulletin, in case you're new here, there's a, a sheet in there that you can take out and, and look at sometime that explains how you can give electronically through an app on your phone or, or by going to a website, fccgive.org, or, or even by texting, texting an amount. And of course, you can give on Sunday mornings, just as many of you did a little bit ago, but the principle we see in this widow's example isn't necessarily the amount of money, but it's the amount of her sacrifice. It's the, 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 what it represents her devotion to God. And so we teach, you know, that, that uh, Scripture says that a good thing to shoot for, a good target is a tithe, is, is 10%. Now, that's not a law in the New Testament as it was in the Old Testament. We are not commanded that thou must tithe, but the New Testament says that we're just to give as we have been blessed. And over and over in the New Testament, it reminds us that we are so much more blessed than the Old Testament person. But we need to regularly sacrifice and like that widow in the story. Now, Jesus said, and I love this, he said to the disciples, now, that woman has put more into the treasury than, than any of these other people. Now, we know kind of what he was talking about, sort of metaphorically, because of, of what it represented. It was a sacrifice. But I think, I think Jesus had something else in mind. I think he wasn't necessarily talking about the temple treasury when he made that statement. He tells us, you know, don't store up for yourselves treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Jesus is always, always, always far more concerned about what we're storing up in the heavenly treasury than he is in what we're giving on earth. But it is a reflection of our faith, of our maturity. And so we see that this, this widow got heaven's attention, got Jesus' attention, and Jesus called his friends over and said, look at this woman. Look at the faith that she is demonstrating. 
Well, we also, I think, can get heaven's attention when we show faithfulness in suffering. Faithfulness in suffering. Now, this is such a a comfort that in our times of suffering, that we are in God's sight. That God knows us and cares about us passionately. passionately. In Acts chapter 7, there's a a kind of a heart-wrenching story about a guy named Stephen. And and Stephen had, had just sort of preached the sermon, but really what he'd done is he had taken the Jewish leaders to task. And he just laid them out. And so they didn't like that, obviously, because that, you know, they didn't like being called out on the carpet like that. And so, so they started persecuting him, and he was suffering this great persecution. In fact, Stephen is the first Christian that we hear of in the Bible that dies simply because he, he's a martyr, simply dies because of his faith in Christ. And so he, he gives a speech to the Sanhedrin, and, and, uh, and they don't like it. And so in, in Acts 7.54, it says, when they, were, when they heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and he saw the glory of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And it goes on to say that they dragged him into the city and they, and they stoned him. But it's interesting to me because usually in the Bible, almost always, in fact, maybe always, except for this instance, It speaks of of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God, sitting at the right hand of God. That is a a, a sort of a symbol of completion, that Jesus has accomplished what he came to do and that he was in charge and he's sitting on the throne at the right hand of his father. But it's interesting to me that at this crucial moment in the history of the church, when this man is suffering great persecution for Stephen, Jesus stood. That's an amazing thing. He stood because of this man's suffering and watched what was going on. And certainly when we suffer, and especially when we suffer simply because we're Christians, as many, many are doing around the globe these days, you can rest assured that God does not forget about us, that God has not overlooked us, that that we have the attention of heaven. There's another amazing passage in Revelation. Revelation is all about the persecution and the suffering of God's people. But in chapter 8, the, these, these, these seals are being opened. And when it comes to the seventh seal, it says that there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. In Revelation 8, 3, it says, Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Literally in heaven, heaven stopped so that these prayers of the saints, most of whom suffering and persecuted, so that the prayers of the saints could be brought to God, could be brought to God's attention. And the Bible has a whole lot to say about about how God is aware of our suffering, about how God cares deeply about everything that his children go through. But people forget this sometimes. People say, well, I I don't feel God, so he must not be there. And and honestly, this is one of the things that we're going to address in that series. I want to believe, but I want to believe that God cares for me, but I can't feel him. I can't see him. I can't sense him. He must not care about me. But he does. Psalm 56, 8 says, you keep track of my sorrows. You have collected my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Isaiah 49, 16 talks about how God has not forgotten you in your suffering, that he has your names inscribed on his hands. When we are faithful in obedience, when we are faithful in giving and putting God first, when we are faithful in times of suffering, we get heaven's attention. But there's another time, and I think this is really what I want to say this morning, that we get heaven's attention when we are faithful in our last moments on this earth. And you can rest assured that if you are a child of God, when you come to your last breath in this world, you can trust that you have the full attention of heaven and of God. Hebrews, I love what Hebrews says of angels. It says, aren't angels ministering spirits sent to serve? And I think that is primarily to attend to us when we die. You see, we don't have just one guardian angel. Uh, you know, I, I love It's a Wonderful Life movie. It's one of my favorite movies, but theologically it's wrong. We, we don't have one guardian angel, but, but we have legions of them. 
And I think they are especially dispatched to minister to us and our loved ones at the time of our deaths. And I know we don't like to think about it. We, we don't like to think about death. We don't like to go to funerals. But I got to tell you, as a pastor, I've done hundreds of funerals. And, and I'm thankful for that because I get a, a regular reminder that one day, one day it's going to be me in that casket. And for you and for me, there's going to come a time when the only thing that will truly matter is whether or not we have spent our life paying attention to God, serving Jesus and his church, loving others. That is the only thing that is going to matter. Not your job, not your vacations, not your bank account, not ultimately even your relationships, but it's going to be just you and Jesus. But the good thing is this, that Jesus is really all you need. That Jesus is, is, is all you need. He's going to be with us in our, in our, during our lives, and he will be with us in our deaths. Several years ago, I came across a song, and I'm sure you've heard of it, a, a song that reminds us of this by a guy named Fernando Ortega. I've loved this song for a long time. I want it played at my funeral one day. But it talks about how there's coming a day when everything will be stripped away, and the only thing that we will have to hold on to is Jesus. On June 14, 2007, Ruth Bell Graham, Billy Graham's wife, died, and, and they had Fernando or Ortega sing this at, at her funeral. So, like, if some of you are around when I die, if you can give Fernando a call and say, hey, can you, you know, Chris really would like this song. But, um, but I want to show you this video of him singing this song uh, at her funeral. Uh, I, I just think it's a wonderful song, and it's a great reminder that Jesus is all we need. Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Mama. And when I am alone, oh, and when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. was the lovely, beautiful, wise woman she was, because early in her life she chose Christ as her center, her home, her purpose, her example, and her vision. And we can all make that choice today. We were married for nearly 64 years, and I wish you could look in that casket because she's so beautiful. I sat there a long time last night just looking at her and praying because I know she had a great reception in heaven. And when I come to die Oh, and when I come to die And when I come to die 
Give me Jesus Give me Jesus Give me Jesus You can have all this world You can have all this world You can have all this world But give me Jesus I first heard that song when I it was at a place in my life. I was at a retreat center. And uh, literally at that time, is 20 or so years ago, I literally felt that everything was coming unglued in my life. And I was reminded that really that's uncomfortable and it hurts, but it's okay because, because really all we have is Jesus in the end. And that really that's all that we need to have. And and we say, well, why just give me Jesus? Why does, why does clinging to Jesus not only get heaven's attention, but also gives us peace in those moments when we feel like we're going to die or maybe when, when we actually are at our last days? It's because of what Jesus does and did for us. You know, God is our heavenly father. And rarely in the Old Testament is God addressed as, as father. That's a very intimate, uh, an intimate term. Rarely is he ever addressed as father in the Old Testament, but all over the New Testament, and especially in G- with Jesus, he is called father. He is called father because that's the relationship that, he, that they have, and that's the relationship that we can have uh, of God, that he is, our, he is our father, he is our Abba, Abba Daddy. But there's one place that Jesus didn't use that familiar tender term for father, and it was on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because it was at that moment that he was separated from his father because of our sins heaped upon him. And he was taking that punishment that should have been ours. He was taking it upon himself. And so in that moment, he called out to God. And I'm sure probably in his mind, it felt like God had abandoned him. And in a sense, that was somewhat true for that moment. But yet, make no mistake about it that it was at that very moment, Jesus Christ, God's son, dying a horrible death for us, that God was at the same time immensely proud of his son. And you can rest assured that all of heaven took notice. John, the disciple, says that our father wants to see the best in us. He wants to be proud of us. He wants to give us good things. He wants to call out to heaven, shh, shh. Hey, c- come over here and, and look what my son, look, look what my daughter is, is about to do. Look at this. I'm, I'm s- so proud of them. And so when we're faithful in obedience, whether it's things like baptism, which scripture is very clear about, or whether it's, it's, it's a sin issue in our life or whatever it is, when we are obedient, God, God knows that. When we give sacrificially, heaven takes notice. Our hearts are realigned. We're reminded that we've brought nothing into this world and we're going to take nothing out of it. And in the end, Jesus is all we have and he's all we need. When we're faithful to him and trust in him, even when we're suffering, even when times are tough, when we say with Job, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. And I know that there are times when we can't feel his presence. I know that there are times when we can't see his hand. I know that there are times when we feel like, what in the world is going on? Where is God? But I promise you that even in those times, we can trust his heart. We can rely on his word. Because a God who would send his very own son to the cross for the sins of you and I will surely not leave us alone in this world to fend for ourselves. And when we're faithful to him, in our last moments, heaven, heaven stands on high alert. Angels are dispatched to minister to us. And I think it's at those times when it seems that maybe no one else in the world notices us, that we are in the spotlight of heaven and that God is looking at us ever more intently. I love a story that a, a pastor named John Orberg tells about, tells about going to see this lady, Mabel. 
Mabel was in a nursing home, and, and she had been in this nursing home for decades upon decades. And he said, when you go into this place, he said it would smell like, like sickness and stale urine. And, and, and he would sit by her bed, and he would just read scripture to her. And then she would begin to recite them because she knew them by memory. And he said that he would, he would often open up a hymn book and, and he'd begin to sing a hymn with her. And, and here's a lady who's completely blind and mostly deaf. And she all of a sudden would start singing along with every hymn that he would, that he would sing. And then she would stop and she would say how one verse of a particular hymn might have been particularly meaningful to her because of her life, because of what she's gone through. But she didn't talk about her pain, about her loneliness. She just talked about her longing for heaven. So for 25 years, she lived strapped in this hospital bed. One day, John Orberg was sitting with her and talking with her, and he just had to ask her. He said, you know, he said, you know, Mabel, I've been coming here and talking with you for a long time, many years. He said, but let me ask you a question. What do you think all these hours of the day, day after day, year after year, what do you think about as you lay here? What do you, what, what's on your mind? And he got out his pen and his paper because he thought, surely I'm gonna, she's going to say something so wise and profound that I dare not forget this. And, and so she said, well, I, I mostly think about my Jesus. He said, well, what do you think about Jesus, Mabel? And she said, oh, I just think mostly about how, how awfully good he's been to me in my life. And, and she said, Jesus is all the world to me. And then she began to sing that old hymn. Jesus is all the world to me my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. And without him, I would fall. So let me just tell you this morning that if you are here without Jesus, you may think that you're doing okay, but there will come a day when you will fall and you will need a savior to pick you up. Um, friends, loved ones, I promise you that in your last days, all you're gonna have is Jesus. Do you know him? Do you know who he is? Do you know what he did for you? Have you accepted that for yourself into your heart? Because without him, we will all fail.